All right, so um, we started talking a little bit about water and air pollution and policies that have been in place over the last 50 or 60 years to deal with those. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the pollution itself. Um, there are uh, two main types of pollution in the most fundamental sense when we're talking about groundwater pollution. So water pollution, water pollution we can think of as being either point source or non-point source. So point source pollution is um, is uh, things like let's see point source things like um, septic tanks, which we've talked about. So if your uh, if your well is uh, near somebody else's septic tank, obviously you are at risk of getting whatever uh, diseases that might be in their effluent. Uh, this is a little bit of an old uh, statistic, but roughly 800 billion gallons of uh, water um, are discharged each year out of septic tanks. Um, and in general, um, you want to, uh, you obviously want to have septic tanks separated by a reasonable distance and, uh, not, and not have the density of septic systems too great. Um, but that depends on, you know, things like the things we've talked about, the, uh, the, um, hydraulic conductivity of the soils or sediments. If the hydraulic conductivity of the soils or sediments is too low, then the material that's the effluent out of the septic systems is going to have a harder time draining away and its concentrations are going to build up and so forth. You also worry about proximity to streams. If hydraulic conductivity, just to go back to this, if the hydraulic conductivity of the of the um, of the sediment is too low, then the material coming out of septic systems won't have anywhere to go, and it'll build up. If it's too high, then the water that comes out of the septic systems can just zip along and very quickly, without undergoing much biodegradation, uh, make its way to somebody else's um, somebody else's well. So we have to worry about the ability of water to travel too quickly as well as too slowly away from septic systems. And then things like, you know, the, the slope of the land surface, all these things are going to impact how quickly the water moves away from the, uh, from the, uh, septic system. And there have been some classic examples in, um, in Polk County, Arkansas, back in the seventies, uh, 1971, there was a viral hepatitis outbreak that was triggered to a septic system. So people's wells were, uh, were getting water from an aquifer that had, was being impacted by effluent out of a septic system. And then when they tracked it down, the, um, the septic system was about 100 feet away from the nearest well, which is a pretty good distance uh, but that still was um, not enough to keep uh, to keep these viruses from being able to make it from to survive the septic system and then make its way all the way to somebody else as well. Uh, in Yakima, Washington, in Yakima, Washington, in also in the early seventies, this was nineteen seventy two. There was a typhoid outbreak again associated with a. Um, associated with the septic system. In this case, it was two, over 200 feet from the nearest well. And then, of course, lots of places where wells are located downstream or downhill of septic systems. Uh, people get things like gastroenteritis and that sort of thing. Uh, what are some other um, possible point sources? 
other point sources of contamination? Well, buried fuel tanks are a big one. Buried fuel tanks. Prior to the 1960s and 70s, um, when a gas station went out of business, in some cases, the the underground storage tanks would just be left and there might still be a little bit of gasoline in them. Um, or uh, individuals or farmers might have tanks out on their, on their land someplace or factories might have big underground storage tanks for diesel fuel uh, to run their trucks and their equipment. And if the factory closes, sometimes those tanks weren't, uh, weren't emptied. Or in some cases, the tanks developed cracks and the fuel began slowly leaking underground. And those are, those are refer referred to as lust, leaky underground storage tanks, leaky underground storage tanks. These are a huge, huge problem uh, in the United States and, and nationally. What are some other possible sources, point sources of contamination? Uh, mines. Mines are a big one. Uh, mines are a problem in part because of something called acid mine drainage. So, um, a lot of times, this isn't quite the same with, with coal, where you're mining out whole layers of rock. So, when you have a coal seam, a lot of times you have layers of rock like this, and some of those layers are coal, right? So there's a coal seam, and here's a coal seam, right? But there are other layers that, uh, maybe there's one on top, that aren't. And <clears throat> so what's generally done now in a lot of areas is, well, the, well, a couple of ways to do it. One is you literally scrape off the top of the mountain in order to expose the coal seam. That's called mountaintop uh, removal coal mining. Or you simply go in and you, you mine out the entire layer of coal there uh, from the side. That's sort of a, a more expensive and old-fashioned way to do it. Um, in association with coal, which is compressed organic matter, compressed plants, if you have lots of um, compressed buried plants, in order to preserve all of the organic matter that made up those plants, you have to have had very little free oxygen. Because if you had oxygen around, it would have reacted with the plants and would have broken them down and turned them back into carbon dioxide or something. So um, this is what's called a very uh, reducing environment. Reducing environment. And all that means is there's not a lot of oxygen around. Yeah. So what you get then in reducing environments, if, if there's any sulfur around, the sulfur becomes reduced. And reduced sulfur, um, which... Uh, can react with iron, reduced sulfur reacts with iron to produce a really common mineral called pyrite, which is otherwise known as fool's gold. You guys have all seen this at some point or another. Um, well, interestingly, there's fool's gold associated with coal deposits. There's often a lot of fool's gold associated with um, gold and silver deposits, silver mines. As well, it's a really common mineral, and um, it's associated with a lot of the materials that that are mined in the Western United States, in the Rocky Mountains, or in the Appalachians, or all these different places, right? Wherever there's coal or gold, uh, you have to get fool's gold. And the reason this is a problem from an environmental perspective is that when the fool's gold, which is FES2, that's its chemical formula, is exposed to the atmosphere through mining, you you uh, either pile up big piles of, of crushed rock that are the, the leftovers from the, from the mines, or just by digging mine shafts into the mountainside, you allow air and water to go in there. Well, what happens is that it reacts and it forms iron oxides, and, uh, and it, the oxygen oxidizes the sulfur. So I don't worry about writing this out anymore, but let's just say that the, the sulfur becomes oxidized. And when that happens, you can get uh, that when this oxidized sulfur 
reacts with water, what you produce is sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And uh, this is a very, very strong acid. So water that's leaching out of, um, out of mines is often very, very acidic because of the presence of sulfuric acid. And we refer to this, again, as acid mine drainage. So this very, very low pH, very acidic uh, solution washes out of mines and goes into streams and it so acidifies the rocks, or excuse me, it so acidifies the, the, um, the water that it can damage the, the wildlife that's living there, everything from plants to fish to crayfish to whatever. The other thing that happens is, so let's just say um, acid, acidic water, damages damages wildlife in streams and lakes um, and the other thing is um, metals like iron for example or aluminum um, aluminum are much more mobile they're much more easy to transport they're much more soluble in acidic water and so the, um, the high amounts of these metals, high concentrations of metals in acidified streams, acidified streams also harm wildlife and in some cases, make the water just kind of look disgusting. You'll often see rust colored water. Uh, and the reason the, the streams or acid mine drainage is often rust colored. And the reason it's so rust colored is it's just loaded with iron. And the iron is abundant in this water because it's so easy to transmit water in low pH or, or acidic solutions. So acid mine drainage is a big problem. <clears throat> what else? What are the, some other point sources? Well, here in... Um, in Iowa, we have, or in a lot of places around the country, we have CAFOs, which are confined animal, confined animal farming operations. And there are huge manure ponds that are built, and sometimes those things, the dams on those things will burst, and they'll go, all that manure will go flushing into the uh, into the nearby river and cause, um, and cause uh, problems with the with the fish and that sort of thing. What else do we have? Um, Non-point source. Oh, and then of course, uh, industry. Industry. So wherever, um, you know, wherever a factory or something is, is ejecting water, <clears throat> say wastewater into a lake. Uh, and this doesn't have to be necessarily even related to the chemical composition. Um, um, some factories and power plants um, use water from rivers as a coolant. So the water is not actually being used in any kind of chemical process. It's just being cycled through a, a plant in order to cool the um, cool parts of the equipment. And when the water is released back to the river, it's much, much warmer than the ambient water. And in some cases, that can be classified as, uh, as a point source of pollution, just the water temperature. So non-point source, non-point source um, contaminants or non-point sources of contaminants would be things like agricultural runoff. So unlike a point source where you can point to a particular spot on the map and say that there is, um, this is the site from which the the contaminant is originating, non-point source is, is much more widespread. So the runoff from agricultural farms, um, the fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides from the suburbs are a huge problem. Everybody likes to have a nice rich green lawn, uh, salt water, Salt water from um, from roads. A lot of salt gets added to salt uh, to roads in the winter, and that in and of itself can form a non-point source. 
So what are some different kinds of of contaminants? Well, we also have um, so types of contaminants. We have uh, pathogens, pathogenic microorganisms, microorganisms. We have inorganic chemicals and organic chemicals. So we'll talk about each one, each, uh, one of these three in the next video coming up.